Book 17, Chapters 6 through 8 of The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lincoln Pede. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 4, by Flavius Josephus. Translated by William Whiston. Book 17, Chapters 6 through 8. Chapter 6 concerning the disease that herod fell into and the sedition which the jews raised thereupon with the punishment of the seditious now herod's ambassadors made haste to rome but sent as instructed beforehand what answers they were to make to the questions put to them they also carried the epistles with them but herod now fell into a distemper and made his will and bequeathed his kingdom to antipas his youngest son and this out of that hatred to archelaus and philip which the calumnies of antipater had raised against them he also bequeathed a thousand talents to caesar and five hundred to julia caesar's wife to caesar's children and friends and freedmen he also distributed among his sons and their sons his money his revenues and his lands he also made salome his sister very rich because she had continued faithful to him in all his circumstances and was never so rash as to do him any harm and as he despaired of recovering for he was about the seventieth year of his age he grew fierce and indulged the bitterest anger upon all occasions the cause whereof was this that he thought himself despised and that the nation was pleased with his misfortunes besides which he resented a sedition which some of the lower sort of men excited against him the occasion of which was as follows there was one judas the son of sarifeus and matthias the son of margalothus two of the most eloquent men among the jews and the most celebrated interpreters of the jewish laws and men well beloved by the people because of their education of their youth for all those that were studious of virtue frequented their lectures every day these men when they found that the king's distemper was incurable excited the young men that they would pull down all those works which the king had erected contrary to the law of their fathers and thereby obtain the rewards which the law will confer on them for such actions of piety for that it was truly on account of herod's rashness in making such things as the law had forbidden that his other misfortunes and this distemper also which was so unusual among mankind and with which he was now inflicted came upon him for herod had caused such things to be made which were contrary to the law of which he was accused by judas and matthias for the king had erected over the great gate of the temple a large golden eagle of great value and had dedicated it to the temple now the law forbids those that propose to live according to it to erect images or representations of any living creature so these wise men persuaded their scholars to pull down the golden eagle alleging that although they should incur any danger which might bring to them their deaths the virtue of the action now proposed to them would appear much more advantageous to them than the pleasures of life since they would die for the preservation and observation of the law of their fathers since they would also acquire an everlasting fame and commendation, since they would both be commended by the present generation and leave an example of life that would never be forgotten to posterity, since that common calamity of dying cannot be avoided by our living so as to escape any such dangers, that therefore it is a right thing for those who are in love with a virtuous conduct to wait for that fatal hour by such behavior as may carry them out of the world with praise and honor and that this will alleviate death to a great degree thus to come at it by the performance of brave actions which bring us into danger of it and at the same time to leave that reputation behind them to their children and to all their relations whether they be men or women which will be of great advantage to them afterward and with such discourses as this did these men excite the young men to this action and report being come to them that the king was dead this was an addition to the wise men's persuasions so in the very middle of the day they got upon the place they pulled down the eagle and cut it into pieces with axes while a great number of the people were in the temple and now the king's captain upon hearing what the undertaking was and supposing it was a thing of higher nature than it proved to be came up thither having a great band of soldiers with him such as was sufficient to put a stop to the multitude of those who pulled down what was dedicated to god 
so he fell upon them unexpectedly and as they were upon this bold attempt in a foolish presumption rather than a cautious circumspection as is usual with the multitude and while they were in disorder and incautious of what was for their advantage so he caught no fewer than forty of the young men who had the courage to stay behind when the rest ran away together with the authors of this bold attempt judas and matthias who thought it an ignominious thing to retire upon his approach and led them to the king and when they were come to the king he asked them if they had been so bold as to pull down what he had dedicated to god yes said they what was contrived we contrived and what hath been performed we performed it and that was such a virtuous courage as becomes men for we have given our assistance to those things which were dedicated to the majesty of god and we have provided for what we have learned by hearing the law and it ought not to be wondered at if we esteem those laws which moses had suggested to him and were taught him by god and which he wrote and left behind him more worthy of observation than thy commands accordingly we will undergo death and all sorts of punishments which thou canst inflict upon us with pleasure since we are conscious to ourselves that we shall die not for any unrighteous actions but for our love to religion and thus they all said and their courage was still equal to their profession and equal to that with which they readily set about this undertaking and when the king ordered them to be bound he sent them to jericho and called together the principal men among the jews and when they were come he made them assemble in the theatre and because he could not himself stand he lay upon a couch and enumerated the many labors that he had long endured on their account and his building of the temple and what a vast charge that was to him while the Asamoneans, during the hundred and twenty-five years of their government, had not been able to perform any so great work for the honor of God as that was, that he had also adorned it with very valuable donations, on which account he hoped that he had left himself a memorial, and procured himself a reputation after his death. He then cried out that these men had not abstained from affronting him even in his lifetime, but that in the very daytime, and in the sight of the multitude, they had abused him to that degree as to fall upon what he had dedicated, and in that way of abuse had pulled it down to the ground. They pretended indeed that they did it to affront him, but if any one consider the thing truly, they will find that they were guilty of sacrilege against God therein but the people on account of herod's barbarous temper and for fear he should be so cruel and to inflict punishment upon them said what was done was done without their approbation and that it seemed to them that the actors might well be punished for what they had done but as for herod he dealt more mildly with others of the assembly but he deprived matthias of the high priesthood as in part an occasion of this action and made Yozar, who was matthias's wife's brother high priest in his stead now it happened that during the time of the high priesthood of this matthias there was another person made high priest for a single day that very day which the jews observed as a fast the occasion was this this matthias the high priest on the night before that day when the fast was to be celebrated seemed in a dream to have conversation with his wife and because he could not officiate himself on that account joseph the son of elymas his kinsman assisted him in that sacred office but herod deprived this matthias of the high priesthood and burnt the other matthias who had raised the sedition with his companions alive and that very night there was an eclipse of the moon but now herod's distemper greatly increased upon him after a severe manner and this by god's judgment upon him for his sins for a fire glowed in him slowly which did not so much appear to the touch outwardly as it augmented his pains inwardly for it brought upon him a vehement appetite to eating which he could not avoid to supply with one sort of food or the other his entrails were also exulcerated and the chief violence of his pain lay in his colon an aqueous and transparent liquor also had settled itself about his feet and a like matter afflicted him at the bottom of his belly nay further his privy member was putrefied and produced worms and when he sat upright he had a difficulty of breathing which was very loathsome on account of the stench of his breath and the quickness of its returns he had also convulsions in all parts of his body which increased his strength to an insufferable degree it was said by those who pretended to divine and who were endued with wisdom to foretell such things that god inflicted this punishment on the king on account of his great impiety yet was he still in hopes of recovering though his afflictions seemed greater than any one could bear he also sent for physicians and did not refuse to follow what they prescribed for his assistance and went beyond the river jordan and bathed himself in the warm baths that were at caliroe which besides their other general virtues were also fit to drink 
which water runs into the lake called Asphaltiris. And when the physicians once thought fit to have him bathed in a vessel full of oil, it was supposed that he was just dying. But upon the lamentable cries of his domestics he revived, and having no longer the least hopes of recovering, he gave the order that every soldier should be paid fifty drachmae. And he also gave a great deal to their commanders and to his friends, and came again to Jericho, where he grew so choleric that it brought him to do all things like a madman. And though he were near his death, he contrived the following wicked designs. He commanded that all the principal men of the entire Jewish nation, wheresoever they lived, should be called to him. Accordingly, they were a great number that came, because the whole nation was called, and all men heard of this call, and death was the penalty of such as should despise the epistles that were sent to call them. And now the king was in a wild rage against them all, the innocent as well as those that had afforded ground for accusations, and when they were come, he ordered them all to be shut up in the hippodrome, and sent for his sister Salome and her husband Alexis, and spake thus to them, I shall die in a little time, so great are my pains, which death ought to be cheerfully borne, and to be welcomed by all men. But what principally troubles me is this, that I shall die without being lamented, and without such mourning as men usually expect to the king's death. For that he was not unacquainted with the temper of the Jews, that his death would be a thing very desirable and exceedingly acceptable to them, because during his lifetime they were ready to revolt from him and to abuse the donations he had dedicated to god that it therefore was their business to resolve to afford him some alleviation of his great sorrows on this occasion for that if they do not refuse him their consent in what he desires he shall have a great mourning at his funeral and such as never had any king before him for then the whole nation would mourn from their very soul which otherwise would be done in sport and mockery only he desired therefore that as soon as they see that he hath given up the ghost they shall place soldiers round the hippodrome while they do not know that he is dead and that they shall not declare his death to the multitude till this is done but that they shall give orders to have those that are in custody shot with their darts and that this slaughter of them all will cause that he shall not miss to rejoice on a double account that as he is dying they will make him secure that his will shall be executed in what he charges them to do and that he shall have the honor of a memorable morning at his funeral. So he deplored his condition with tears in his eyes, and obtested them by the kindness due from them, as of his kindred, and by the faith they owed to God, and begged of them that they would not hinder him of this honorable morning at his funeral. So they promised him not to transgress his commands. Now any one may easily discover the temper of this man's mind, which not only took pleasure in doing what it had done formerly against his relations, out of the love of life, but by those commands of his which savored of no humanity, since he took care, when he was departing out of this life, that the whole nation should be put into mourning, and indeed made desolate of their dearest kindred, when he gave order that one out of every family should be slain, although they had done nothing that was unjust or that was against him, nor were they accused of any other crimes while it is usual for those who have any regard to virtue to lay aside their hatred at such a time even with respect to those they justly esteemed their enemies chapter seven herod has thoughts of killing himself with his own hand and a little while afterwards he orders antipater to be slain as he was giving these commands to his relations there came letters from his ambassadors who had been sent to rome unto caesar which when they were read their purport was this that acme was slain by caesar out of his indignation at what hand she had in antipater's wicked practices and that as to antipater himself caesar left it to herod to act as became a father and a king and either to banish him or to take away his life which he pleased when herod heard this he was somewhat better out of the pleasure he had from the contents of the letters and was elevated at the death of Acme, and at the power that was given him over his son. But as his pains were become very great, he was now ready to faint for want of somewhat to eat, so he called for an apple and a knife, for it was his custom formerly to pare the apple himself, and soon afterwards to cut it and eat it. When he had got the knife, he looked about, and had a mind to stab himself with it, 
and he had done it had not his first cousin Akiabus prevented him, and held his hand, and cried out loudly. Whereupon a woeful lamentation echoed through the palace, and a great tumult was made, as if the king were dead. Upon which Antipater, who verily believed his father was deceased, grew bold in his discourse, as hoping to be immediately and entirely released from his bonds, and to take the kingdom into his hands without any more ado. So he discoursed with the jailer about letting him go, and in that case promised him great things both now and hereafter, as if that were the only thing now in question. But the jailer did not only refuse to do what Antipater would have him do, but informed the king of his intentions, and how many solicitations he had had from him of that nature. Hereupon Herod, who had formerly no affection nor good will towards his son to restrain him, when he heard what the jailer said, he cried out and beat his head, although he was at death's door, and raised himself upon his elbow, and sent for some of his guards, and commanded them to kill Antipater without tiny further delay, and to do it presently, and to bury him in an ignoble manner at Hyrcania. Chapter 8. Concerning Herod's Death and Testament and Burial and now Herod altered his testament upon the alteration of his mind, for he appointed Antipas, to whom he had before left the kingdom, to be tetrarch of Galilee and Perea, and granted the kingdom to Archelaus. He also gave Galonitis and Traconitis and Panias to Philip, who was his son, but own brother to Archelaus, by the name of a tetrarchy, and bequeathed Jarnia and Ashdod and Phasiles to Salome his sister, with five hundred thousand drachmae of silver that was coined. He also made provision for all the rest of his kindred by giving them sums of money and annual revenues, and so left them all in a wealthy condition. He bequeathed also to Caesar ten millions of drachmae of coined money, besides both vessels of gold and silver and garments exceedingly costly to Julius Caesar's wife, and to certain others five millions. When he had done these things, he died the fifth day after he had caused Antipater to be slain, having reigned, since he had procured Antigonus to be slain, thirty-four years, but since he had been declared king by the Romans, thirty-seven, a man he was of great barbarity towards all men equally, and a slave to his passion, but above the consideration of what was right, yet was he favored by fortune as much as any man ever was, for from a private man he became a king." and though he were encompassed with ten thousand dangers, he got clear of them all, and continued his life till a very old age. But then, as to the affairs of his family and children, in which indeed, according to his own opinion, he was also very fortunate, because he was able to conquer his enemies, yet, in my opinion, he was herein very unfortunate. But then Salome and Alexis, before the king's death was made known, dismissed those that were shut up in the Hippodrome and told them that the king ordered them to go away to their own lands, and take care of their own affairs, which was esteemed by the nation a great benefit. And now the king's death was made public, when Salome and Alexis gathered the soldiery together in the amphitheater at Jericho. And the first thing they did was, they read Herod's letter written to the soldiery, thanking them for their fidelity and good will to him, and exhorting them to afford his son Archelaus, whom he had appointed for their king, like fidelity and good will. After which Ptolemy, who had the king's seal entrusted to him, read the king's testament, which was to be of force no otherwise than as it should stand when Caesar had inspected it. So there was presently an acclamation made to Archelaus as king, and the soldiers came by bands and their commanders with them and promised the same good will to him, and readiness to serve him, which they had exhibited to Herod, and they prayed God to be assistant to him. After this was over, they prepared for his funeral, it being Archelaus's care that the procession to his father's sepulchre should be very sumptuous. Accordingly, he brought out all his ornaments to adorn the pomp of the funeral. The body was carried upon a golden bier, embroidered with very precious stones of great variety, and it was covered over with purple, as well as the body itself. He had a diadem upon his head, and above it a crown of gold. He also had a scepter in his right hand. About the bier were his sons and his numerous relations. Next to these was the soldiery, distinguished according to their several countries and denominations, and they were put into the following order. First of all went his guards, then the band of Thracians, and after them the Germans, and next the band of Galatians, every one in their habiliments of war, and behind these marched the whole army in the same manner as they used to go out to war, and as they used to be put in array by their muster-masters and centurions, 
These were followed by five hundred of his domestics carrying spices. So they went eight furlongs to Herodium, for there by his own command he was to be buried, and thus did Herod end his life. Now Archelaus paid him so much respect as to continue his mourning till the seventh day, for so many days are appointed for it by the law of our fathers. And when he had given a treat to the multitude and left off his motoring, he went up into the temple. He had also acclamations and praises given him, which way soever he went, every one striving with the rest who should appear to use the loudest acclamations. So he ascended a high elevation made for him, and took his seat in a throne made of gold, and spake kindly to the multitude, and declared with what joy he received their acclamations and the marks of good will they showed to him, and returned them thanks that they did not remember the injuries his father had done them to his disadvantage and promised them that he would endeavor not to be behindhand with them in rewarding their alacrity in his service after a suitable manner, but that he should abstain at present from the name of king, and that he should have the honor of that dignity if Caesar should confirm and settle that testament which his father had made, and that it was on this account that when the army would have put the diadem on him at Jericho, he would not accept of that honor, which is usually so much desired, because it was not yet evident that he who was to be principally concerned in bestowing it would give it him, although by his acceptance of the government he should not want the ability of rewarding their kindness to him, and that it should be his endeavor as to all things wherein they were concerned to prove in every respect better than his father. Whereupon the multitude, as it is usual with them, suppose that the first days of those that enter upon such governments declare the intentions of those that accept them, and so by how much Archelaus spake more gently and civilly to them, by so much did they more highly commend him, and made application to him for the grant of what they desired. Some made a clamor that he would ease them of some of their annual payments, but others desired him to release those that were put into prison by Herod, who were many, and had been put there at several times. Others of them required that he would take away those taxes which had been severely laid upon what was publicly sold and bought. So Archelaus contradicted them in nothing, since he pretended to do all things so as to get the good will of the multitude to him, as looking upon that good will to be a great step towards his preservation of the government. Hereupon he went and offered sacrifice to God, and then betook himself to feast with his friends. End of Book 17, Chapters 6-8 through 8. Read by Lincoln Pede, Plundermind.com